Hello, welcome. This is Daniel Peabody. I'm a director at Elizabeth Leach Gallery and I have with me this evening, Michelle Ross and Alexis Day. Thank you both for joining me. We're here to talk about their shows. Um, Michelle's show, I Am Your Signal and uh, Alexis's show, Faceted Time and Expectations. Um, Michelle's gonna speak first. Uh, thank you all for joining us. If you have questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat box and we will ask questions towards the end of each segment. Michelle is going to speak first and then Alexis will speak second. Michelle, welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, hi, friends. Thanks for being here. Um, yeah, I'm just going to launch right in and kind of talk generally about the exhibition. And then uh, if people have questions about individual pieces, um, they can ask in the chat. So this body of work started um, mid-2020 concurrently with a, a big commission I was doing for the standard insurance company. And so the scale of the larger works are sort of um, predicated on the, the individual panels, the scale of the individual panels for the large works at the standard. Um, and I, I, I started these that we're seeing, these, these large ones, as a kind of run at working at that aspect ratio and that scale. Um, so they were sort of begun concurrently in mid-2020. Um, the medium size and smaller pieces I had started before the commission and kind of put them aside and then revisited them and got them going again and really got going on this like late October. Um, so it's all kind of come together really quickly in the last few months of 2020. Um, the title of the show, I Am Your Signal, strangely came to me just fully formed as a sentence um, sometime in late 2019 when I was working in the studio and it literally like I just heard it in my my head um, and so it stuck with me and it's you know I wrote it down and it's been with me for over a year and at the same time I've been reading um, quite a bit of work by the German um, art historian Isabel Gra um, and she has this notion of paintings as quasi subjects. She thinks they have a kind of quasi subjecthood and she sort of points to the um, tradition of paintings um, sort of being anthropomorphized by their makers, by the painters. And um, we often hear that and think of that, you know, the painting told me what to do. And so the, the title, I sort of put that it sort of came to me that maybe that was the voice of the painting. Um, and so I'm thinking about that as the voice of the painting. And even in the face of such a declarative statement, I am your signal, um, the questions kept coming up for me, which aspects of the paintings might be the signal and what exactly is being signaled. So there's some ambiguity that's being sort of um, embedded into the work. Um, I'm, I was asked to kind of think about, talk about what I'm inspired by. And the first short answer is the sky every day. <laughs> I look out my window um, and it's probably kind of evidenced um, with this painting that's um, actually called Idle Wild um, that's, that Gwen is on right now. Um, but I would also say that um, there's a kind of conceptual framework that is, that is formal and that I'm inspired by the visual complexity that I was working on with these works. Um, I was working on building a visual complexity out of competing elements. So I work really intuitively. Um, I'm working to balance these competing interests. And um, it occurred to me, you know, in late 2020, just a couple months ago, as I was working, that the work was really kind of absorbing and channeling the difficulty and the conflicts and the challenges that I think we're experiencing culturally, but also personally um, of this last year, over the whole year. So um, what, I, what happens is I recognize that content and the concepts and the themes as I'm working. I don't set out ahead of time to say, you know, I'm gonna try to make paintings that are about difficulty and conflict. Um, but there is this kind of competing um, sort of um, set of elements. On the one hand, um, there's this sort of poured, organic, flowing, improvisational sort of way of working with the elements and the materials. And then there's also this plotted and planned 
more precise, more controlled, um, more measured moves that I'm making. And so it's sort of like there's a competition and a, and a sort of um, a con maybe not a conflict because the work has to hold together formally, but this competition between um, what's getting attention and what's, what's gaining attraction um, in the work. Um, the other thing I would say is that at what's been on my mind with this body of work that's maybe a little bit new, but that has tracked through. I mean, geometry and my interest in geometry has tracked through several bodies of work. Um, and the idea that geometry is both this kind of controlling element, this element that humans use to map um, and dominate um, both geography and space. Um, but it's also something that I refer to as a mystical technology and geometry is a language that is used um, also to express sort of some of the greater, greater cosmic mysteries of the, you know, of our, of human knowledge. Um, so that is tracked through with this work, but something somewhat new is um, that my relationship to abstraction has been really deepened um, by reading um, David Getze's work on queer abstraction. Um, his theorization of, of queer abstraction as, as this thing that's kind of always um, failing to be, um, you know, definitive and that it's also um, a strategy of resistance. Um, and so I'm interested in, and I have been actually since grad school, but Getsy's one of the first people I've encountered that's theorized this idea that visibility uh, may not be um, an ideal um, sort of way to be in the world if, if, if there's sort of vulnerability. Um, and I think with queer communities that, that um, visibility is at the same time a really important strategy for um, for acknowledging presence and agency. And, and so not to rule out that as a strat visibility as a strategy, but abstraction being a way to sort of deepen my um, resistance to representation. Um, and representation, it's, it's a strategy that resists representation as distinct but not opposed to the demands of being seen, um, especially figuratively. So. I'm thinking about, with that, I'm thinking about all of the social and political signaling that's been going on in the last year and the ways in which visibility and representation get abused and twisted and turned against the signalers. Um, so my work then sort of sits in this place that's more concerned with form as an analogy for embodiment. So, you know, dealing with forms in space is a way to think about, um, and for me as, as a painter to be embodied, have the work be embodied without it being explicitly um, depicting bodies. Um, so I'm concerned with how forms fit into space um, and what an ill fit looks like um, when they maybe don't fit in quite um, you know, in a, in a comfortable way that there's maybe an awkward fit. Um, I'm also really concerned with how pictorial spaces, these spaces that I'm constructing with these materials, with the flows and the geometry, how those spaces can both beckon a viewer, but also kind of resist or repel um, the viewer. Um, I'm also really engaged in putting pressure on the edges bleeding boundaries, emptying out um, centers and affirming peripheries. Um, and that's really important, this idea of like kind of emptying out the center and affirming the periphery. Um, these formal decisions are actually the content of the work, um, meaning that, you know, thinking about a center that maybe isn't as solid, isn't as certain, and really what's going on in the periphery is something that is, um, more faceted, more complex, um, has more pressure and tension is something that I'm interested in. Um, so I'll just, you know, 
I just want to, you know, just kind of reiterate that these formal decisions really is the content of the work. And in the words of Getsy, these formal moves are um, meant to allegorize social relationships through a playing out of formal relations. Um, so with that, I think that's a good place to start, stop. And if, I don't know how long that was, Daniel, but if- You are right on time, Michelle. Awesome. <laughs> You're right on time. But there are a couple questions that I um, that I want to ask. And um, there's a few of you folks who have said hello, but on online in the, in the um, in the comment area. And so if anyone else has questions, uh, they can go ahead and type them in the comments and we will try to get the artists to answer them for you. Uh, but Mac McFarland uh, says that the title and the idea of, of some things gaining and some things losing attention make me think of signal to noise ratios, wondering what the noise was or how the noise finds its way into the work slash signal. Yeah. Thank you, Mac, that's so right spot on. So I was definitely doing some looking into signal noise ratio and, and thinking about it in terms of, you know, what's ideal for audio experience, which is a lot of signal and, and less noise. And, and, and once I started looking at that concept, I was thinking about visually, I think with this work, there's, there's kind of a 50-50, a kind of a, a, a balance of noise. And I think part of the noise is this really highly reflective silver, silver leaf, silver paint, there's silver oil paint, silver spray paint. And what that does, and the camera is kind of picking it up right now too, um, which is like, it really destabilizes um, the static quality. Like as the viewer moves, as the camera moves, there's these flashes of light or dark, um, the silver can go really dark um, as well. And so it becomes this kind of, um, you know, jangly kind of noise that destabilizes. And I think also um, there's a lot of matte and shiny sort of experience with depending on how much solvent or how much oil is in the in the paint on the surface. And that can also be, you know, again, like how, where do you stand to get the right view and what is the right view? Um, and, and so, yeah, thanks for that, that thought, that question. And there are, I had, I had one question, which was you talked a little bit about the social aspects and about how you were, that was coming up in the work, but so much about the work, having spent some time with them in person, uh, which I encourage everyone who's watching, if they are able to do that, to try and do that. Um, but uh, so much of them is about kind of this, this breaking up of space and this, um, you know, this, this, um, you know, in one of them, in the one that's a little bit to the right of the one we're looking at now, the large indigo one, mm -hmm. there's an element where there's this sort of form on the left uh, that's sort of light and reflective. And, you know, it kind of recedes behind the indigo form, but then in the bottom, there's that little line that moves around and then brings it to the front. So there's this like push and pull of space. Um, and I'm wondering about how the kind of social, uh, yeah. Um, competition you were talking about, how that kind of manifested in the, the sort of structure, the visual structure of this paintings. Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, I'm thinking about it as I'm working in, and reflecting on the work when it's done. So like, again, I don't set out to like illustrate some sort of social relationships, but but it, it occurred to me that like, what's this kind of pushing and kind of this larger form that's in the middle, that's taking up a lot of space, that's got, kind of a vacuous uh, center is 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 like maybe an analogy for things that we think are central in our culture that maybe we shouldn't be you know focusing so much on the center and we should be looking at those the smaller forms or those like brighter color forms or those areas on the edges that you know don't always get the same kind of attention as something that's in the middle i mean again so it's it's an analogy it's an allegory it's it's sort of not a direct sort of depiction of 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 the, of those social kinds of pressures and tensions. Great, thank you. And then I'm just gonna, um, just a few other comments. Uh, Carleen McConnell um, said, says, I'm seeing optical illusions and three-dimensional forms trying mm -hmm. to break the plane, which is a really good observation. And then uh, a few other folks have just sent their congratulations. Pat Boa, Sam Hoppel, and <laughs> Megan Atia have all said how, um, uh, how much they're enjoying seeing the image of the show. Uh, so with that, we're gonna um, uh, move on from talking about Michelle's 
show, at least for the moment, we can come back to additional questions towards the end if that works out or people have additional questions. But now I want to introduce Alexis Day, who's going to tell us a little bit about her show, A Faceted Time and Expectations, uh, which um, uh, the camera is going into that room now. So you can see these pieces and we'll hear from Alexis. All right, hello everyone. And thank you for coming to my show, Faceted Time and Expectations. I will first introduce this series, then discuss my process before speaking about some of my key conceptual themes. This series spans the entire year of 2020. All of these pieces were already in process and in my studio when COVID and quarantine started last March. I had already formed some ideas and had intentions for each of these pieces, but as the year progressed and my perspectives changed, the way I thought about and built up these artworks changed as well. I use many different types of materials and processes to create these artworks. I first take photographs with my DSLR camera. I look for scenes and narratives that trigger me to think about time, memory, and female experience, or more specifically, the influence that culture has on female experience. I then curate and edit these images on my computer before printing them onto fabric. When I bring these fabric images into the studio, I then have a second experience with them. I respond to the photo and depending on the image, work to abstract or deconstruct it. I use paint and fabric to build up the artwork and drawing media, thread and collage to add character and complicate the surface. Um, would the camera please mind moving over towards Endeavor, which is the piece with the woman in the car? I work on every piece, both intuitively and intentionally. I will intuitively make marks with paint, drawing media, and even thread. When I'm working in this way, I allow myself to move and mark the artwork at will. I also slow down and very intentionally select collage materials and the imagery that I embed into the artworks. Additionally, I'm very engaged when I respond to the initial composition, intentionally juxtaposing, contrasting, and emphasizing different elements. So for in this piece, if we look at the interior of the car, so the initial photograph um, was just kind of dark and uh, like a dirty rusted vehicle. And I chose to choose something very different. Uh, it's like a field of sequins, so it's shiny and reflective. So this is me contrasting what was in, in the initial image. Whereas if you move over to a robe, and you can see that there's all these printed flowers. I've emphasized this like attribute by embroidering these little stitches and adding an element to highlight this aspect. So this is an example how I'm playing with the image while I'm building it up. Uh, I work on each piece like it's a puzzle, working back and forth between mediums and processes and balancing out colors, textures, and imagery until it feels complete. I work on multiple pieces at different stages at the same time. In a single studio session, I may start by painting on one artwork, then while that dries, cut details out of a second and apply stitching to a third. This flexibility helps me stay focused and excited about my studio process as I can switch what I'm doing depending on my mood. The different pieces may start one after another, but they move forward incrementally, reaching completion at different paces. In this way, they shift alongside each other and grow as a series. Um, with the artwork mind moving to uh, derivation, so that's the one with the big X's. Yes, thank you. All right, so I chose to mount this body of work in a new way. I built wooden frames that I wrapped the artworks around, similar to how traditional canvases are built. This was a, both a practical and a creative decision. Practical because it provides more protection for the artworks and helps maintain installation consistency. But I'm most, I'm most excited about the creative possibilities. I see this way, to, way of mounting as an armature, a framework to build a sculpture on. This mount gives me more control over what is loose or tight and helps me better manipulate visual perceptions as I play with added depth. It also reinforces one of my favorite compositional devices, which is the frame within a frame. So I chose this piece to talk about this aspect for because it does the frame within a frame so well. We have the, the structure, which is 
a rectangular shape, then you have that key image in the middle and all of the windows, which are also frames, and then the grid in the back is an additional set of framing. So you really can just move into these spaces. Uh, it also, we have the, the grid in the very back, and then we have the sequins and the thread in the front, and there's multiple layers happening between them. So it also just illustrates this kind of sculptural aspect of the works. Uh, would the camera then move mine, sorry, move to Paradigm, please, which is the artwork with the women at the table? Thank you. I'm influenced by three key interests. My first is essentially how people are influenced by the cultures that they are a part of. I'm interested in social constructs and how they impact life decisions and aspirations. Social constructs are ideas and customs that are widely accepted and believed within a society. They can feel unquestionable to the people living within the social structure, yet they vary drastically by geography, community, and era and time. A few that I'm interested in are what is considered feminine or masculine, what life de decisions are deemed successful, and many of the expectations woven into marriage and motherhood these invisible guides and influences are hard to examine, slow to change, and full of glitches that can be outdated or problematic. I tend to look at this issue from my perspective as a woman and make creative decisions to feminize my work to encourage dialogue in this direction. However, as my interest in this grows, I'm starting to examine this topic on a broader scale as well. And negative impacts are truly far reaching. Um, would the camera move back towards antecedent, which is the one with all the light bulbs on the ceiling? My second key theme is the relationship between time and place, something I think of in two separate ways. I'm interested in how structures and locations change over time, providing tangible evidence of years passing. When thinking about structures in this way, I tend to anthropomorphize them, seeing chipped paint and walled up windows like wrinkles on a face. The second way I think about place and time is contrarily how locations can physically stay the same but shift identity through use and decor. A great example of this is the Mass Mocha Museum in North Adams, Massachusetts. The complex began as the Arnold Print Works, became the Sprague Electric Factory, and is now an amazing contemporary art museum. Thousands of people have moved through the space over the past hundred years, living and working in the same location, but performing different roles and tasks. When thinking about architecture in this way, I associate its structure metaphorically with the structure of society. The infrastructure stays the same as the different generations pass through it. I was considering this idea as I built up both of these two larger artworks, which originated at Mass Mocha last year. I try to embed time and history into all of my artworks in a few ways. I layer materials and leave visible process marks to reference the artwork's creations and use repurposed materials from my mother's old dress to curtains from Goodwill. Repurposed materials have had previous lives and bring traces of their history into each artwork. Finally, my third key theme is psychology and the internal mechanisms of the mind. These include memory, perceptions, and identities. All of these are formed by combining many small fragments of information together. These fragments are a mixture of accurate, inaccurate, pivotal, and minute moments that are combined haphazardly in the mind. These entities are constantly changing, degrading, and merging together as our, as our minds reference the past, process the present, and try to predict future events. I am forever intrigued by how we use this unstable platform to base ourselves and our realities on. I'm not only inspired by this concept, but actually near it when I construct my artworks. Just like memories are combinations of many different experiences, my process is a combination of many different mediums and processes. Fabric, photograph, paint, collage, and thread all merge together and become something new. Some of the artworks in this series began with very specific intentions. Others were more intuitive, but they all arise from the same process and are tied together through their shared conceptual inquiries into female experience, time, and the mind. 
Uh, so the camera, yeah, just stay here on borderline. That'd be great on this piece. Uh, this series developed differently than how I typically create a body of work. The pieces examine a broader range of ideas and were developed over a longer period of time. They were also developed through the beauty and challenges of the recent civil rights protests, the incredibly divided US political election, and the COVID virus with all the anxiety, fear, and isolation that it has perpetuated. These experiences influenced how I thought about, crafted, and paired these artworks together. I think it's fascinating to try and imagine how differently each artwork would have developed with my original tensions in a pre-COVID world. For instance, I originally selected the photograph that started this piece for its abstracted composition. But as the tensions of the year progressed, the scene of a fence running through a rural environment with barbed wire cutting into the sky took on more weight and meaning. Would the camera now move over towards the woman in the window introspect? Thank you. This piece, introspect has changed as well. I took this self-portrait to reflect a passing moment of isolation, but it has grown to reflect a year-long experience. I previously considered windows and portals as gateways, separating different realms of reality or aspects of the mind. I still see windows in this way, but after the globally shared experience of quarantine, they now represent more to me and feel more emblematic. I see them as dividers, not only between inside and outside, but between past and present, self and other, and who we want ourselves in the world to be and how we in the world actually are. In sum, I think these pieces are stronger for having endured the year from Paradigm, which finished in January, to Introspect, whose last threads were added in December. This series spans the length of 2020. This is a collection of mixed media artworks that stand with their own distinct identities and narratives. They were created out of a fascination with time, the mind, and culture, and reflect this turbulent year and my navigation of it. Thank you. Thanks, Alexis. Um, yeah. That's great. So uh, there's a couple questions. Um, I, I one of the, one of my questions, which I'm just going to ask first, and then I'll get to some of the questions from the comments. Um, in both of those two pieces, we're actually seeing them right now. The two pieces that you um, where the images came from your residency at Mass Mocha, where they're actually uh, I know three of them, um, the images were from, from your time at Mass Mocha, but the, um, you referenced it in what you were talking about, but it was, um, I'm not sure if the reference exactly aligned with the imagery when, with the camera, but the way there's um, multiple layers of images, I mean, all of your pieces are very layered, but where there are these very subtle images, kind of ghost images of people from the past, I thought that was really interesting. I wanted to uh, make sure you um, touched on that. Yeah, so these two are the most intentional of the pieces in the series, and I was at my residency when I started them, and I was really kind of focusing on a specific place and the time and history of a specific place. So I found historical imagery of textile mill workers from the era of the Arnold Printworks, which was the Mass Mocha's original identity, and then also imagery from when it was the Sprague Electric Factory. So there's bonneted women working mill equipment, and then in this piece, there's mid-century women wearing pencil skirts who are running phone lines, and on the other piece, there's they're actually you can't tell anymore, it's, it's gone, it's too obscured, but they're making gas masks uh, at the Sprague Electric during World War II. So we have two women there and then one on the right. And then I kind of lost the, uh, the in the process of creating the composition, the, the photos of the Arnold print works kind of went away a little bit, but I've snuck in different attributes in the, into the fabric that are hinting at that as well. Great, uh, thank you. There's a couple comments. Um, uh, well, and Mac McFarland has a question for you, Alexis. Um, he says, I'm wondering how you combine or resist or work with the different forms and ways of framing photographs versus the edge of painting slash artwork. Does the photo lead your composition? I'd say, uh, so I, I kind of missed some of that. You were breaking up a little bit, oh, but. Sorry. I can repeat it one more time. Um, okay. Mac McFarland asked, I am wondering how you combine or resist or work with the different forms and ways of framing. Photographs versus the edge of painting. Does the photo lead your composition? 
Yeah, so um, they all start um, in the tapestry form and I'll build them up just pinned to my wall for most of it. Um, and then when they get pretty far along, that's when I've mounted them onto the piece and then pushed those perceptuals, what's in the front and what's in the back a lot more. But a lot of it is built up when it's already just a tapestry. So adding the, the frame uh, just kind of increases the distance, but it doesn't um, change the initial way that I'm building it up. And photograph, it's definitely where these pieces start, um, but they change a lot through the process. Um, and they really do feel like a combination between the textile, the photograph and the painting to me. Great, thank you. There's, um, there was another comment about uh, just saying, just commenting how beautiful the imagery was and talking about how much, how the colors within each one were created such a really nice story. Um, and I think it's interesting. I did have someone in the gallery um, the other day who said how they felt like their perception was really shifting when looking at your work. Um, and that led, up, led, um, led to us talking about that your undergraduate work was in psychology and how that was all very conscious that you were really trying to shift the people's perception. Um, so I wanted yes, to- Yes, definitely. That's uh, one of my, like I, I mentioned it briefly, the, the mind, mm -hmm. uh, psychology and those different things, but playing with perceptions, I think, uh, it's very easily just to go along with your perception, but even tweaking someone's a little bit through looking at the art, maybe that encourages people to look at other people's perceptions too. Um, so I'm wondering if either of you by any chance have a question for each other, if not, that's okay. But I thought you might, I mean, it's interesting. You're both really uh, doing very interesting things with color in your work and with and with texture. And of course, Michelle, I don't know, we could see from some of the details that you're incorporating textiles into your paintings as well. Um, but I was curious if either of you happen to have a question for each other. If you don't, I didn't prompt, I didn't prompt I, you this ahead of time. And so I'm sorry. I don't really have a question, but just a comment. I didn't really know the social aspect of your work. And I liked that. And I feel like it pairs really well with what I'm thinking about too. Yeah. I agree. And I, and also the, the, the element or the sort of ethic of, of using the work as a way to get people in, in, in maybe different or uncomfortable or or positions, like getting the viewer to think about what position they're in when they're viewing the work. I think that that's actually kind of a commonality between the work, so I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. I do too, that's neat. Yeah, awesome. So um, I'm gonna just remind people if they have any last minute questions, they can put them in the chat. And I'm gonna invite Gwendolyn, who's running the camera, to actually stop and step into the office area and show um, the print wall because also up this month during this exhibition, we have um, these wonderful um, prints by Alice and Saar, uh, who you know we didn't have on the, the opening tonight, the virtual opening tonight, but we do have these beautiful um, wood block, or excuse me, um, block and uh, lino cut prints um, by Alice and Saar uh, mm -hmm. up in the gallery during the um, time of this show, which is February 4th through March 27th uh, of this year. So I just wanted to uh, kind of, you know, put a shout out to uh, Alice and Saar. Um, I was talking to someone in the gallery today and they they weren't aware that Alice and Saar has a sculpture in Portland, a large outdoor sculpture of bronze at Lewis and Clark College, um, which Alice and Saar was commissioned to do. I, I want to say about 10 years ago, um, I'm, I didn't prepare this part of the co conversation, so I don't have it in my notes. <laughs> but um, but uh, when Lewis and Clark commissioned um, her to do that, uh, and it is a portrait of York, the enslaved person that was on the Lewis and Clark expedition. Um, and so Lewis and Clark, uh, acknowledging the history of the namesake of their, their university, uh, wanted to acknowledge uh, York, who was also part of that expedition. And so uh, Allison was commissioned to do that. So it's really fun for us, or exciting for us is a better is a better word, exciting for us to have some of Alison Sarr's work, um, newish work up in the gallery. Some of these are 2019, some of them are 2020, 2021. So just finished the beginning of this year. Um, and if the camera can just uh, pop back into the other rooms real quick, oh, we'll just have another view through those really quick. And that looks like there's just um, a couple more people who are uh, singing praises of both exhibitions. I don't see any other specific questions. Um, so with that, I just want to thank both Michelle and Alexis for the incredible shows yeah. um, and for agreeing to join us tonight for our virtual opening. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah.
They're fantastic shows, and I hope uh, folks will come by uh, in the next uh, two months and um, see them in person. They're great over the camera, but they're even better in person. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> so uh, please come in if you're, if you're able to do that and take a look in person. So thank you both for joining us, and uh, thank you everyone in the audience for joining us and all the great questions. Um, and everyone, uh, have a good night. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.